Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Reformation Red Pill Podcast. I am your host, Joshua Hames, and today is a special day. Today is a special day. Why? Because in the studio, sitting right next to me, it's just me and the man himself. You guys know who I'm talking about. The man himself, Robert Murphy! <laughs> oh, man. That theme, theme song is playing. Oh, it's playing. It's yeah. playing. They could hear it coming from a mile away. They yeah. knew. Yeah. Our people know. Preverb is happening, yeah. yes. Yeah. So today is a very special day because it is the teaser episode for Reformation Rants with Robert Murphy. I literally made that title up today. I hope it sticks. Yeah. Yeah, I think go. it's good. I think it's good. So basically, what what are the Reformation rants with Robert Murphy? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked, because it is the very special patron-only show that we are giving to you today for free. For free. It's basically a teaser to get you to come join our Patreon so that we can make more of these episodes. Yes. Um, because it turns out starting a high-quality uh, Christian Reformation content media company is rather expensive. I would think so. Yeah, yeah. So uh, basically what we do is on our Patreon, all our Patreon supporters are invited to Discord where we constantly are hanging out, we're asking questions, we're having a good time. But I... I I asked our, I polled our wonderful Patreon supporters and got uh, a list of questions for mm -hmm. Senior uh, El Jefe, the man himself, Robert Murphy, to answer our theological questions. Now, before we get into those theological questions, I want to know, Robert, what are your credentials to be answering these theological questions? Uh, well, I was visited by a moon goddess who gave me a special... No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Okay, charismatic up yeah, in yeah, here. Yeah, no, the, the, I anointed myself apostle like Robert Duvall. Uh, no, <laughs> I, uh, I went to uh, Covenant Seminary, uh, got a Master's of Divinity, and uh, I have been teaching uh, Bible. I've been an elder in the PCA, in the CREC, and just wanting to, to, to learn more voracious appetite... I, I have to know everything. This is this is the, the goal is to just uh, f figure figure it all out, and I won't let it go until I do. I, it is incredible to me every time I've had some kind of theological question, I and it just like dawns on me or occurs to me. I ask Robert, and, and Robert knows. <laughs> right, that's that needs to be just like a soundbite. Robert knows. You have a question, Robert knows. Robert knows, or he will know within thirty minutes after asking that question the, if he doesn't, which is, is yet to happen. I I I drink and I know things. So. <laughs> he drinks and he knows things. In I fact, <laughs> this is not planned. Uh, Robert walked in today and said, "I've got some homework for you," and he gave me this, <laughs> which uh, you can't read it, but it says a Christian Catholic Reformed Theopolitan Confession version zero point one point three. And Robert <laughs> said to me, "He's like, oh yeah, this is my uh, personal summary of Reformed theology. Just if you could just read that and give me some feedback." Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll get on it. We'll you, get on it. You don't you don't have like ninety six pages just of, of thoughts just ready to fresh dump out of your brain. Well, <laughs> well I am actually going to read this. I'm very excited about it. Um, and uh, what are you are you trying to get that published? By the way, maybe someday. Yeah, but I, I would definitely want a lot of feedback. And like the whole point is to have it be what what we all believe together here. And yeah. that I I love the Westminster standards. I think they're they're mm -hmm. great. But just. Things have happened in the last uh, five hundred years. years, right? That <laughs> yeah. there, there is more, and and that we, I think, do have a lot of consensus on mm -hmm. things, and it'd be great to get it written down and express that. Love that, love that. Well, let's jump into our questions. So, as you can see, Robert is a very qualified theologian to answer our Reformed theology questions, which is why we have the segment Reformation Rants with Robert Murphy. So, <laughs> here we go. We're going to start off with our first set of questions from one of our Patreon supporters, Drew. Um, he's he was early to join uh, join our crew. Awesome guy, and we've been uh, having some fun in the Discord. So, if you want your personal personalized refor Reformed Theology questions answered, join our Discord, man. Please. Come join the Patreon. Yeah. Join us. We have a lot of fun. So the first question here from Drew is, uh, uh, he, he basically asked for what would be your first recommendation for a summary of all of Reformed Theology? Yeah. Like uh, maybe uh, some books. Where would you start with a summary of Reformed Theology? Yeah. 
So I think the best place we've mentioned several times uh, on this show is R.C. Sproul, mm -hmm. is that he just had a gift for expressing succinctly, clearly, personably, uh, what, what a great guy, uh, su super missed. Um, and his uh, book, uh, What is Reformed Theology?, is a very approachable if you want to be reading something with sitting down with a friend and and is not a theology nerd. Mm -hmm. This is the great intro things. If if you're a little bit more like okay, this person is a Christian, mm -hmm. and maybe our primary difference is like the Reformed part, the Chosen by God book uh, by Sproul, then is going to be a really great uh, book. If that's the only difference here, yeah, I, I we we really can't. Um recommend rc sproul enough mm. he, i he may be he may go down in history as one of the key figures to bring a revival about amongst christians when it comes to reform theology I should say bring about to be the beginning of another reformation in many right. senses yes exactly he, i mean he almost single-handedly just went to work to bring reform theology to the masses through his radio show back in i don't know when that was started in the 80s or in 70s. the 80s yeah, yeah my my dad even listened to him and he was very not reformed but yeah. he was, uh, but he was reaching tons and tons of people because of his solid, biblically, uh, uh, doctrinally biblical right. uh, teaching that he was bringing forth, and you, you couldn't debate him, right? You yeah. know, because <laughs> he's bringing the word, he's bringing what the word says, and Always uh, coming back to scripture, exactly as Calvinists do. Yes, um, which is uh, which is funny because we get the charge of. Uh, oh, I'm not. You, you call yourself a Calvinist, but I I follow Jesus, right? Which is a fundamental yeah. misunderstanding, yeah. of Calvinism, right? We're not out here like with. I think there was a monk episode one time where they had like a shrine of uh, Calvin uh, on the piano, and it's like, what are you doing? This is not. I, I most people I know who are Calvinists don't know what Calvin looked like. Like they just have never seen a picture, right, even right, right. So right. This is yeah, why? Yeah, malarkey. You're one of the only people I've ever heard make a monk reference. <laughs> and I love that you did, because I grew up watching monks. Oh, such a good show. Yeah. Such a good show. But yeah, I think that the if, if somebody needs a sort of modern person speaking modern language to them, uh, Sproul, you, you can't go wrong. But as, as we'll get to since some other questions here, Reformed you know, theology is, is Christian, Catholic, universal theology. So reading the creeds, reading the Fathers, reading Augustine, mm -hmm. reading Calvin, reading Luther, mm -hmm. uh, all of these things... There's some learning curve. There are some translations that make it feel old and crusty. Yeah. Um, so, but if, if somebody wants something modern, accessible, bam, mm -hmm. hand it to them. Mm -hmm. Can't go wrong with Sproul. Well, let's jump into another question from Drew. Um, he had the question, so he was raised Baptist, mm -hmm. as all of us were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're American here. This yeah, is, yeah, this yeah, is, that's this right. part and parcel. Yeah. Um, so he was raised Baptist, and... So we are a part of a denomination, a rather small denomination net right now, although growing yeah. immensely Leaps and, and quickly. Yeah. Um, we are a part of the CREC, which is the Communion of Reformed Evangelical Churches. Right. Uh, what makes the CREC, the CREC unique is that we are a Reformed de denomination, but we don't uh, separate on the topic of baptism, on right. the issue of baptism, Yes. which is... Very rare throughout all history. And it was even tested in the last year. It was very tested, and yeah. I was uncertain as to which way it would come out. Right. But uh, uh, old Doug Wilson gave a, a rousing speech. Yep, rallied the in, troops. In favor of, uh, of keeping Unity. us together. Yes. Um, and you know what? I think, I think what that is, it is him seeing what time it is. Mm -hmm. Because uh, is this an issue that's worth really hammering out and going to bat for yes. 100%. Amen. And it has throughout history, and it's been divisive throughout history. And I say divisive, you know, people hate on denominations. Right. Um, the idea of denominations. Yeah. But I I think as, as of right now, at this point in church history, denominations are actually a very good thing. Yes. Um, because what it, it enables you to actually follow your conscience as right. you see the Word of God... Um, as you believe the Word of God ought to be interpreted, yeah. right? Um, and so you've got our Reformed Baptist brethren who are convicted to the heart that we should not baptize our babies, that only those who can profess faith uh, should be, uh, and demonstrate that they are regenerate at some level, uh, make, a, make a credible profession of faith, ought to be baptized. And they truly believe that. Yeah. Um, 
why, it's a good thing for them to have a place that they can worship the Lord, yeah. and then for us to have our, a church where we worship the Lord, and we go through these practices that we believe, we believe that b- baptizing babies is biblical, they believe it is not biblical, and so, but we can both agree on building the kingdom. Right. Right? And we can even be in the same denomination. Well, that's what I was getting to, is the yeah. fact that in the CREC, we can even be in the, the same denomination. So denominations are actually good because they provide uh, the Christian with the ability to actually follow their conscience as they see right. um, as yes. they see fit, you know? Exactly. Um, and I, I think that, you know, was that necessary to separate over denomination, uh, separate into different denominations before? Yes, but we are at a... Uh, a crisis moment yeah. in the battle. Right. And if you are reformed, if you hold to covenant theology, if you are, uh, yeah, if, if you are holding to the word of God, confession, yeah. like we said, holding to the dark roast reform stuff, yeah, right? right? If you're covenantal, confessional, yeah. and uh, Calvinistic. Yeah, Philadelphia, London Baptist. Absolutely. Come on, come on. Let's link arms yes. and fight this battle together, this because cultural war there's together. there's nobody that we have more in common with. Right. And and so like rather than doing the typical fleshly thing, which is like, the people closest to me are the people I hate the most. Right, is right. That, let's not do that. Here. Right. Let's link arms, and we have so many other pressing battles from the world right now. Yes. And we... So right now, so we don't have the luxury of... Uh, infighting has a negative connotation... It's necessary to right. work out our doctrine. Sharpen that iron. Exactly. But we don't have the luxury of dividing over baptism right now, I believe, mm-hmm. because we we are currently under threat of a tyrannical state that yes. is coming for our rights, coming for our children. And how many people in the church are on the, are bowing down? They're here in the bagpipes and they're like, I love me that they're golden statue. They're paying that incense to Caesar. Yeah, well, yeah. I just like, I don't want to get thrown in the furnace here. No, I'll bow down. Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. Yikes. And so that's what's happening. So if we've got strong brother, brethren saying, no, we're not going to bow down. We disagree on baptism. We say, okay, that's great. Let's do this. Let's yes. do this together. Yes. Maybe in 500 years. Yeah. We won't, you know, we'll we'll uh, we'll work this out. We'll. <laughs> but I but I think that like when the question to come back to uh, to Drew's question here is that when somebody says Baptist in America, they probably aren't necessarily thinking of an Al Mohler and a John Piper mm-hmm. kind of person. Mm-hmm. Is that just generic altar call American church? America. Baptist, America, first letter M. Yeah, uh, that kind of Baptist. Mm-hmm. And I think we do have a significant difference with that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And Absolutely. So uh, yeah, even there I was I was referring specifically to our reformed Baptist which you said brethren, most of the time. Our 1689 yeah. yes. reformed yeah. Baptist confession that's what I said confessional confessional covenantal Baptist and reformed. Calvinistic. Yeah. Um now as we'll get into in a second it's a different version of covenantal. Right. Um especially particularly with a view towards our children but we'll get into that in a second. Yeah. So uh to get down into the so that was our our little side quest on yes. on defending denominations they're yes. good because it provides us uh, the avenue to worship according to our conscience however they're only good it, just to re- circle back to this and put a cap on it um they're only good if you are in agreement that we are both in it together as far as building God's kingdom right right so if That's denominations the are at each other's catholicity piece exactly yeah the catholicity piece yeah because if we're at each other's throats um particularly Bible believing denominations. So I'm yes. thinking of, you know, Reformed Baptists, Reformed Presbyterians, even those Reformed Baptists who would never go to a CREC church because we they can't stomach the sight of a right, yeah. of a baby getting baptized. Yep. Even even them, um, as long as they say no and I understand why they wouldn't want to come to our right. church. Because if you really yeah. believe yeah. that it, you know, a child having communion is eating and drinking damnation upon themselves, I can yeah. see why that might rub you the wrong way. Yeah. Um, but if you can say, okay, I don't agree with you, but let's build God's kingdom together. Yes. Let's link arms to take the city for Christ. Yeah. Let's do it. Right. Okay. It's Amen. good that we can worship separately. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so let's let's answer his uh, more spe- more specifically answer Drew's question, which is what are the differences between generic Baptists? Yeah. And the CREC. Right. And so I think the the main thing here in terms of our American, you just have to have a view of history, Mm -hmm. which is to say that we have made decisionism, my personal choice is fundamental, and and you can call it Arminianism, you Mm -hmm. can call it a bunch of other things, but it's also just really gotten wrapped up in American culture, is that I have decided to follow Christ. If that is the center 
of your theology and not Christ chose me Mm -hmm. uh, before that, is that you really then have, and just to put it really baldly here, you have yourself on the throne. Yes. Is that the fundamental difference between me in heaven and looking down across the way at uh, the the rich ruler who, you know, did not make it into heaven and say, what's the difference between us? Is that if if I'm going to be tempted to say me, Mm. that's the difference here, is that I get the glory for being here in heaven. You haven't read Ephesians 1. You haven't, you're, you're not basic biblical literacy and and that american baptistic decisionism yes i think is really a source of much confusion and inability to read the bible the best uh like short summary that i heard from this or that i heard on this point was from john piper mm. asking the question i may have done, uh, said this on another episode but where he basically boils it down to the question you have died you've gone to heaven you're standing before the throne of grace and god asks why are you here? Right. The Baptists, the I say the Baptists, kind of the modern decisionistic Baptists. Yeah. Because there are Baptists is such a wide range. Right. It's a huge umbrella. It's a huge umbrella. Um, the kind of the modern decisionistic Baptist would say, well, because I put, I asked the Lord Jesus to come into my heart. Right. And so, and what John Piper says, if you say anything, and I agree, if you say anything besides your grace, yes, you're wrong. You. You God. are you the God reason I'm me. here. Yes. You descended from your throne of grace mm-hmm. in the person and work of Christ. You chose me before the foundation of the world. And yes, I cooperated with that grace because you called me. Yeah, you renewed me. You renewed you my heart. Put, you chose me. Yes. You called me. Yes. Yeah. You justified me. You and you sanctified me, which we cooperate with. Right. So, and that's the thing. And we got into it on the, I think it was on the Dark Roast Reformed episode. Yes, we Calvinists believe in free will. Yeah. We absolutely believe it. Exactly. What's uh, Jonathan Edwards' um, defense? Freedom of the will. Freedom of the will. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's in the title. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We believe in free will, yes. um, but it's a free will in conjunction with the ultimate sovereignty of God. And that's a tension, you know, we, we're not going to understand this side of heaven. Right. No. That, no. That, and all good theology comes down to that humility piece first and foremost. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. God is three and God is one. Right. If you don't begin with humility, then this is a God of your invention and not the God who is. I like what... Uh, Oh, Sinclair Ferguson says. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, he's so great. You can just listen to him, that mm. Scottish accent. But he says, where the Bible makes an end of teaching, I make an end of learning. <laughs> Amen. You know? And it's Amen like, yeah, that, yeah, that's it. You know, I, I don't know. If I don't know, uh, um, if the Bible doesn't speak to it, right. it doesn't marry perfectly in our understanding right. God's sovereignty and our free will. Yeah. But we believe it because the Word of God is the ultimate authority for all of faith and life. Right, and so when we trust him, right, and that's it. So, uh, so let's let's uh, let's try to, I guess, wrap this question up. What what would you say are the differences between the CREC and the Baptist? Society? We kind of talked a little bit around it, but let's like let's let's uh, hammer it down, nail it down into some. some I mean, points. some real you know quick bullet points. There is that by and large, nearly every single CREC church has covenant renewal service. Mm-hmm. That it is not about the sacrament of the altar call. But the actual sacraments instituted by Christ. Mm. Uh, oh, that's that, <laughs> that's good. That's, it's, that we're going through books of the Bible and not having. I mean, you can have a topical sermon as your church needs mm-hmm. to have a particular topic addressed. But overall, the Word of God dictates what we are hearing about week by week, mm. reading and studying and and delving into. And that the church is defined by God, called by God, and to the members who God has called, we are going to exercise church discipline, have church, have community, have mm-hmm. fellowship, according to the definition of who God is calling. That's who we are. That's so good. The uh, That was a great... I'm going to use that. The <laughs> It's not about... We don't make it about the sacrament of the altar call. We actually make it about the sacraments that Jesus instituted. The white, real ones. Yeah, yeah. the real ones. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, because that that is so true in the modern evangelical church. That has become the sacrament. Right. Um, and it and it all boils. It all comes back to what you were saying before that decisionism. Because we believe that if we if we don't leave that altar call every Sunday, yeah. Well, then someone may want to make a decision, but they didn't have a chance to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it, it's it's so I had the chance before. You know, our church recently switched from having one rental, so we met in the afternoon, to another rental, so we meet in the morning. But mm-hmm. before that ended, I wanted to go to the big uh, Baptist mega church one time, and. 
it really was in the exact same place mm. as where we have the Lord's Supper, you and mm. I do mm-hmm. together, is that right after the sermon, there was the like every every head bowed, every eye closed, mm-hmm. let's dim the lights, let's have the worship team strumming here. And if there's anybody who's felt convicted by the word that we, like, it was a sacrament. Mm-hmm. It really struck me as like, I know y'all hate that word, but like, man, you really did this mm. as a sacrament. And the sad part is, is that not all Baptist churches, but v- many, many Baptist churches in that vein, kind of that mega church, um, big, fast, famous model. Yeah, um, they will treat that moment with utter sanctity. Right. But then when it comes to commu- communions in the back, yeah, just yeah. go go do it. Yeah. We'll play the music. Just go do the communion. We'll have chips and cokes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Version this time. Here, yeah, try yeah, to make it more yeah. Relevant. They treat they treat the the body and blood of Christ. Right. Not. I, you don't want to say with disdain, but like, not with reverence, right? And versus, yeah. you just look how much real estate it takes up in the New Testament. How we, we get it four times. Yep. Yep. Uh, Synoptic Gospels and Corinthians is like this is a really heavily emphasized part of the New Testament is yeah. having the Lord's Supper be done right. Like, yes, it's a big deal. Mm. Those are some great summaries. Anything else that you would say that distinguishes us from uh, the CRE or the CREC from the typical modern? Baptisty. I mean, I think I think it's going to come up again in a minute. But again, we've mentioned a couple times the Catholicity piece is to say that we are in continuity with the one true Church that has always been, and that there are many, many people in Baptistic American circles who say the Church really came into existence in the 17, 1800s, maybe maybe 1900. Like like it's 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 a you know God dropped the ball for a long time is a big part of their view, and that we're like, we don't need to reinvent mm. the wheel and be alone here in the last 150, 200 years, because God has been saving people throughout all time, and since Christ, the church has existed continually mm. in varying degrees, uh, but continually since uh, the cross. It has been there since Pentecost. Man, that is, that's a, that's a, that's an important point, the fact that uh, many, many evangelicals today believe that there was this <laughs> incredible gap yeah in history where like the first Christians in the first century had it right right and then after that they yep. just totally flubbed it yep Jesus the Holy Spirit left in the year 100 yeah yeah and that's came right. back in the year 1800 yeah, yes. <laughs> with, <laughs> with Darby in the right yeah, yes. yeah that's right yes um, exactly. and, and the Schofield Bible right. the Schofield Bible yeah. yes yeah um oh, yeah man. that's that's problematic yes right that's not Christianity like there were people hashing this out. If you believe in the Trinity, if you believe in in the Bible, these were things that Christians were were fighting over and hashing out and defining and getting rigorous mm-hmm. about what is Christianity, yep. Council of Nicaea, Council of Chalcedon. These, these are important pillars mm. of who we are. Hello there, faithful listener. The Reformation Red Pill podcast needs your help. For those of you who don't know, this podcast is brought to you by The Forge Press. And we here at the Forge Press have invested upwards of $30,000 and spent the last six months building out this lovely studio that you see behind me. For those of you who are just listening, trust me, it looks really good. Now, why have we invested all of this time and money, you may ask? The answer is super easy, barely an inconvenience. We invested all this time and money so that we can bring you, dear listener, a whole host of Reformation resources. We started the Forge Press to help arm Christians with the spiritual tools and weapons to build, defend, and expand the new Christendom. So we are starting off here at the Forge Press by focusing on podcasts and short-form videos, but we will soon hope to branch out to documentaries, hymn and psalm singing music videos, and even animated children's content. Why are we doing all this? Because we believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ can and will reform our decaying culture. And we here at the Forge Press just want to play our part in that cultural reformation. So, how can you help? I'll give you three ways. Number one, we have an immediate need that is beyond our financial means at the moment. This lovely studio that you see before you does not, in fact, have air conditioning. Now, I made it through the winter with just a space heater, but I don't think I can make it through a Tennessee summer with just a fan. So we got a quote from a local HVAC contractor who said he could install a mini split AC and heating unit in the studio for $8,500, which 
for me was a shocking price tag. Turns out it costs a lot of money to be cool. So if you want to help us stay cool here at the Reformation Red Pill podcast, there will be a link down in the description to the donation page on our website at The Forge Press. The second way you can help us out would be to join our Reformation Red Pill Patreon. Now, we already have a growing list of Red Pill reformers who support the podcast, and we're working on some pretty great perks for the community. Such perks include exclusive content, access to our Discord community, which is totally lit, or fire, or riz. It's riz. It has riz. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. Not to mention, we have some pretty sweet Reformation Red Pill merch. So if you want to support the podcast, join our Patreon and become a Reformation Red Pill reformer today. And finally, the third way you can support this podcast is simply to just give us a like, subscribe, comment, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and share this podcast with a friend who needs it. You know what friend I'm talking about. Seriously, that stuff helps us out more than you know. And now, without further ado, let's jump back into this week's episode of the Reformation Red Pill podcast. Of who we are. That's so good. Okay, uh, let's get into uh, our last question from Drew. Yes. And basically, he's asking for an elevator pitch for Covenant Theology. All right, so you're on uh, floor one of the Empire State building, so you've got a little... you got a ways to go. Thank you for the building choice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Um, Or or maybe... uh, we can go for the the Khalifa. What is the tower? Burj Khalifa. Burj Khalifa. Yes. Yeah, we'll go for that one. Nice. Go oh, wow. Okay. We got a little extra time. Excellent. Um, and uh, yeah, give us your elevator pitch for covenant theology. First of all, what is it, and why should I believe it? So the the tr- the question, what we're really deciding here is how do we organize biblical data in our mind? What is the spine running? So theologians have a fancy, fancy word. It's mitte, M-I-T-T-E, and it's just German for middle. So like, what is the center? What is the spine that helps us organize and think through whole Bible theology? So many people today do not have a whole Bible theology. So I'm glad you're asking the question. That's great that we want to have a whole Bible theology. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the best contender, according to covenant theology, is that covenant, God makes promises and has particular ways of dealing with humanity, starting from Adam, to Noah, to Abraham, to Moses, to David, to Ezra, to Christ, Mm. that there are these unfolding series of progressive revelation Mm -hmm. has come out and God has shown more and more and more and changed how we relate to him. That it's not some just like casual, let's just hang out, bro, Mm. kind of way of dealing. This is God, Mm -hmm. and that he has established the means by which you know we are made right with him and and how that whole economy that world mm. works out and so the there's really just two choices if you've come to that level and to say i want whole bible and i want it to be honoring the text mm-hmm. at each phase is dispensationalism which started 200 years ago and has had an incredibly bumpy history is that at every point they've been like, oh, that doesn't work. Let's change. Oh, that doesn't work. We got to, oh, that doesn't work. And it's, it's you know, even uh, MacArthur's, you know, leaky, did, like it's really sketch versus for 500 years now, the best formulation of it has been along these covenantal lines mm. and it has grown in momentum and added more like a rich tree that has grown mm-hmm. in terms of an approach to scripture of how do man and God come together given mm. our rebellion against him. And you say for the last 500 years, uh, this idea of covenant theology has been growing, and we'll say but or and, uh, the the theologians who um, brought us this rubric weren't didn't just pull it out of a hat. No, they were no. reading Augustine. Right. They were reading the early church fathers. Yes. They're obviously scripture. They're pulling it straight from scripture. Yes. Right. And so you, they're pulling on I'm just threads. saying the name covenant theology. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I'm just further giving that defense for that person who goes, well this is, okay, theirs is 200 years old. Ours is 500 years old. You right. know, what's, you know, it's a few hundred years, but what we're saying is is uh yes, the name covenant theology is 500 years old, but it reaches all the way back through church history. Oh, right, and and all through the Bible, like you said, is that like one of the primary descriptions of a sinner is a covenant breaker. That's right in the Bible. Yeah. And then how often um, it's not reckless love; it's covenant love is actually what defines <laughs> yeah, right. God. There, shots is fired. That, yeah, is that the? I, I'm going to get my Hebrew on here. And Chesed <laughs> is that just? It's so fun. But that the 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 covenant faithful loyal love mm. of Yahweh to His people is the. Th- 
line throughout all the scriptures here is that what is it that defines him? He's faithful to the covenant. Mm -hmm. What is it that defines sinful man? Breaking the covenant. Yeah. And so like the real central biblical role that this plays in defining who we are and what page are we on and how are we reading and how's the story unfolding mm -hmm. is that this this is and then you know as uh we we get, hear the blessing from Hebrews you know by the blood of the eternal covenant that there's a real good case to be made that this is the overall history of everything best organizing principle is that God chose us before the foundation of the world and I'm going to send my son to mm -hmm. pay for your sins so that you can be with me for all eternity mm -hmm. that covenantal relationship within the trinity is mm. is now what gets expressed in these different iterations and ultimately most fully and then retroactively through Christ, through yep. Jesus, is that this is the way to understand yep. how to relate to God. And we go through this in much greater detail in the dark roast, uh, the light roast Calvinism versus dark roast Reformed episode, if you want to go check yeah. that out. Yeah. Um, but uh, even to even to kind of wrap up this, this question and this... Part of our conversation is that uh, would you say a summary of it would be to say that God primarily God relates to human beings by way of covenant. Yes, and which what you got at, but what I'll say to kind of um, in a succinct fashion is that the way that God uh, relates to human beings throughout history is first of all in the covenant of works or the covenant of life, as yeah. some have called it. Um, obey and live, yes. disobey and die in right. the garden. Right. There's right? a structure. There's a structure there. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a covenant relationship there. Yeah. Um, the covenant is broken, and then instead of death and destruction and immediate st all start over and you die immediately, yeah. we get, Adam and Eve get grace. Right. And that is how God has chosen to relate to his creation since the garden, covenant of grace. Right. Um, and so all throughout the Old Testament... His God's people were saved by grace through faith. Yes, right. Um, which gets a little confusing because in the New Testament we see, okay, uh, Paul's talking about the old covenant and the new covenant. Well, would you quickly uh, explain that? With if Paul's saying old covenant and new covenant, but we're saying there's one covenant of grace, right. how would you marry those two? Uh, uh, what we're saying about the covenant of grace with what Paul says about old covenant and new covenant. So I think there's only one place where Paul actually uses the exact phrase old covenant is mm. in Corinthians, and that that is very much a derogatory, disparaging kind of thing, is that as Christ has come, if you are returning to try to fall back under Mosaic law obedience, which was never the way that the Mosaic law was supposed to function, mm. is that you are radically not understanding how Christ has come now and what that has done for how we relate to God in, in the new covenant. Mm. Um, but that it is it has always been provisional, that all along the way, Israel was getting a piece at a time. They did not have the fullness of mm -hmm. God come as man died for our sins. But yet, we know now, knowing so much more, angels have longed to look into mm -hmm. what we know now, which is that Abraham was covered with the blood of Christ. Right. He saw Jesus' day and rejoiced. Mm -hmm. David was forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's right. Moses, Adam, all the way through yep. the line, that it's always been about Jesus, and now we know that. So how stupid would you be to want to dial the clock back to the thing that's always been there and unseen mm -hmm. and is now seen? That's right. And you would want to dial the clock back to the pre... That is just absolutely brain it's dead. Madness. It's madness. Yeah. Dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. <laughs> Don't do it. Yeah. And we see that very clearly all over. There's plenty of texts we could point to. The one that comes to mind is, for me, it was Romans 5, where he says the sins that he that God passed over in former times. Right, yes. Um, but now has that all those sins were put on Christ. Right. Right? So uh, God was able to, instead of killing... Adam and Eve for their sin, and Abraham for his sin, and every one of the patriarchs for their sin. Yes. And because what are the wages of sin? Death. 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 And so instead of them getting the death that they deserved, Romans 5 tells us that God passed over those sins, not permanently. Right. He can't, God couldn't remain just and no. just yes. let it go. Right. He was never letting it but go. But he did have a system for like, this is what obedience looks like now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so he, he passed over those sins sins in former times, because ultimately he was going to display his perfect justice yes. on the cross of Christ. Right. Um, I'll never forget, uh, I heard Paul Washer say this when I was just getting uh, Reformation red-pilled, as it were. Yeah. Um, he, I heard Paul Washer talk about how um, 
he's had people ask him, uh, why, why did it have to be so brutal, Christ's crucifixion, and so public, and so humiliating? Yeah. You know, why, why, did this, why couldn't the Son of God come in obscurity yeah. and die for everyone's sin over there, where just, it doesn't just, have to be so humiliating and brutal and awful? Um, and Romans 5 tells us why, because the cross of Christ stands at the center point in all of history, Yes, and it's the center point, why? Because it demonstrates that, hey, all of the sins that were passed over, oh, he uses specifically how uh, in Proverbs where it says, for uh, to, to forgive the wicked mm-hmm. and to... Uh, Acquitting the guilty and condemning the righteous, both are detestable to the Lord. Say that again? Acquitting the guilty and condemning the righteous... Both are detestable to the Lord. So the question then becomes, how is the Lord not detestable to himself? Right. Because all the Old Testament, it seems that he's been not killing yeah. and not punishing right. sinners. Right. Because we've from all the get-go, sinned. from Adam. From Adam. Right. So how is God not an abomination and detestable to himself? And Romans 5 is the exact that that's that's the proof that God has always been just. Yes. He passed over those sins because He was going to put them all on the on the cross on Christ. Yes. Um, and so uh, what was all the passage about? Like, what wh- what is the 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 covenant theology is to then say, okay, there was the initial relationship. God created the world, and mm. it was good, and it was in right relationship with mm-hmm. Him. But as soon as that relationship goes wrong, how is it that we can have any right? relationship right. when we broke it and that from Adam and Eve the skins that God you know killed to animals to make skins to cover them right from the get go the seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent mm. we are the seed of the serpent by default we are on team satan from the from birth now mm-hmm. that's how we come out and yet we can be born again through the blood of Jesus Christ, Mm. which has been available from the fall in Genesis 3, and that it has been worked out more and more and more clearly in Israel, and now we see the true Israel of God, the Son of God, God himself come, paid for our sins in Jesus Christ, and that that ultimate relationship is the fullest expression of the covenant between God and man. Amen. So, And so that's a great summary of... Uh, covenant theology, yeah. right? Uh, we relate to God by way of covenant. Yes. He started with the covenant of works. We broke it, and all the, the the way that God now relates to human beings is via the covenant of grace. Yes, um, and so and then how do we marry that with the old covenant, new covenant language? Well, Paul, when he's talking about the old covenant, he's speaking of the old iteration of yes. the covenant of grace, right? Before the coming of Christ, when things really changed, a new administration was brought about. Yes, by a the new high priest, yeah, a new high priest, right? Right, and what. We don't want to go back to the shadow times when we've got the fulfillment. Right. That's right. Yeah. And even if you were not like doing it after Christ, like those were the the baby steps. That was the sapling tree. And now we've got the full on righteous oak. Mm. And how much worse would it be to try to dial the clock back now? Which is like the whole point of the book of Hebrews. Right. Right. Don't try to dial the clock back, you fool. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. All right. That's great. We're going to move on to the next question. And this one comes by one of our Biggest Patreon supporters, Jack. Man, Thanks, it's Jack. been awesome having you in the Discord, Jack. And he he had a few questions for us. So uh, his first question says that he wants to ask about Reformed Catholicity and Reformed Covenant worship and how they influence community and family life for the better. So um, what is Reformed... First of all, what is Reformed Catholicity? And then what is Reformed Covenant Renewal Worship? Uh, and then how do those impact our family and uh, community life. Well, hopefully, Jack, you're going to a church where you say one of the creeds week by week and say, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, that the the word of the apostles that we have in the New Testament and the word of God from before that, the Old Testament, is the center of what we do. And then who are we? We are the one universal church that has been called by the Spirit of God. And that it is it is semper reformanda it is mm. always in need of growth and reformation and you know purging from error we're still sinful we still sin we need to be constantly working that out so reformed catholicity is to recognize that in the same way you know unless you're in the real deep cage phase calvinism you're going to say arminians are christians but they have wrong beliefs that there are plenty of people in I don't know, the other 60% of people who call themselves Christians, mm-hmm. Catholics of the of the Roman kind, mm-hmm. is that 
just like an Arminian is saved despite what they believe, what they say they believe, because then they get on their knees and they pray for their unsaved family member, right. which to the gentleman God's hands are tied, but not the real God. <laughs> and in, in the same way that uh, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, uh, these people who are part of the same one universal church as us uh, are saved, dis- many of them, despite their theology. Mm. And we would say, you know, there's errors in our theology, and if we knew them, we'd get rid of them. Yeah. But that, like, we're saved despite, we're not saved because of our perfect understanding. Mm. This isn't an intellectual club. Right. Um, and so Reformed Catholicity is that view of, like, yes, we are Reformed. I love what happened. Uh, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, Beza, these are, these are my bros. These are my homies. But... Uh, I'm I'm not looking to say what we said earlier about the the Baptistic theology of like it all didn't get started until 1800. Mm-hmm. God's been working this out all along the way, and that we want to fix and reform the one universal Catholic Church. Mm. So we are reformed and we are Catholic, and we are not shying away from from either of those. So that has a huge impact on what are we doing. On Sunday morning, mm-hmm. we are part of the one people of God lifting up our Lord, praising Him all around the globe. The one body of Christ mm. is everywhere worshiping the one God. On the uh, Lord's Day. On the Lord's Day of one loaf, one body, one baptism, one, 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 mm-hmm. is just said so many times, and we can embrace that, and that's that's Catholicity. Mm. That's good. So, well, okay, I hear you say that before we get on to the covenant renewal worship yeah, yeah. side of things. Um I hear you saying that, and but I, I can hear a lot of people saying, okay, what about Trent? You know, like, that seems to be a denial of the gospel. How can you say that someone who denies the gospel, uh, so someone who's a, a Roman Catholic, yeah, um, who denies the gospel, can they be, how can they be saved? What would you say to that? Well, so, you know, if someone is a full-fledged uh, Arminian, Baptistic kind of, the, the, and they say, God can never go against anyone's will. If they really took that all the way to the extreme, they would be denying the sovereignty of God. Mm -hmm. God saves who he wills. This is God's universe. God does what God wants when God wants to, Mm -hmm. according to God's nature. And like, if you deny that... Well, it seems like I I know a lot of people who do deny that, but they... It's so strange. But they do love the Lord Jesus, but they would say that uh, Jesus say... It's it's very much in that decisionism. Yeah. Anyone can choose. God doesn't choose anyone. And I know that you have to ignore, flat out ignore passages of Scripture to get there. When you get to Romans 9, just turn the page. Exactly. But it's like you were saying before, um, there's not a a theology quiz at the pearly gates. Right. Right. Exactly. And so, um, but then I guess the question gets into is, what must you believe to be saved? Um, in, In other words, what do you have to have right in order to be saved, what would you say? If, if only there had been some creeds written in the first, you know, few centuries of the mm-hmm. church that could help us answer that <laughs> question. That's so vexing and difficult. So, so this is where, you know, honestly, there's nobody that I fight more with than Roman Catholics, and and I, I don't want somebody to hear me say of like, oh yeah, Rome is is the sweet spot. Like, absolutely no. Like, <laughs> I I tortured myself and listened to the uh, Father Mike Schmitz read the entire Catechism of the Catholic Church. Wow. And that was some deep pain. That was that, <laughs> that was, was some thoroughly unenjoyable. I mean, he's a great guy, but like like they do get salvation is through faith alone in Christ alone. They would say that. Mm -hmm. We would say, your understanding of what faith alone means and the roles of the sacraments and parading around Mm -hmm. loaves of thin little circle wafers is is just baloney and, and, and not great. But if somebody says, I believe in the Bible, I believe in Jesus Christ, there is no other way to be saved, um, then, then we have to, on some level say, if, if a few million, if a few hundred million people are in that church, mm-hmm. then yeah, there's going to be some of them that are saved, yeah. and that they know the Lord and are not actually following consistently through with Roman Catholic theology. That's, that's what I've said for years, is that I think that, the, that there are a lot of Roman Catholics who are saved because they're bad Roman Catholics. Yes. I don't know right. if... I think if you're a truly... If you're a good Roman Catholic... I think you may have denied the gospel. You're a bad Christian. Yeah. 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 Right, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But if if you if you're a bad Roman Catholic, meaning that you you don't understand the finer theological points, you don't understand what happened, the denial of the gospel that happened at the Council of Trent. Right. Um, 
which was uh, what was the Council of Trent? What, so, so the the Counter Reformation, the yes. idea that we've got uh, Martin Luther, John Calvin, these guys are coming out. They're clearly pointing out the insanity that has happened in the medieval Catholic Church, the mm -hmm. late medieval Catholic Church, with indulgences, purgatory, extra books of the Bible, craziness. Mm -hmm. They point all this out. And many, many, many people convert. I mean, this right. is where Protestantism comes from, is that they are born again, and yet the people who remain uh, on the Roman side double down, double down and true. say, yeah. this is what we believe. And yep. so, yeah, it is, it is, it is a travesty. Um, you know, Martin Heimnitz, uh, or I can't even remember how to say his name, is German the uh, Lutheran theologian, went through, there's a great book going all the way through uh, the Council of Trent and what's, what's wrong with it. But that you know they've dialed back many of those things mm -hmm. now, and and it's 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 wildly wildly inconsistent. Yeah, it 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 is. It and is. the reason for that is getting into now we're getting into the weeds a little bit, but it's because of dual source tradition. Right. Right. The reason that they're inconsistent is because we have a single source tradition, which yes. is scripture. Yes. That is our ultimate authority. Yes. But we have only one infallible authority. That's right. Yeah. And then, but we and but we still. Hold to tr tradition of, yeah. of the church it's and important. church history. It's, it's important, good. Yeah. but it's there's one infallible, infallible yes authority that we have. But within the Catholic tradition, there is dual source traditions, yes. which means that they have the Bible, yes, and the magisterium, the church, right? right? The Pope. and functionally, this is a fun. If you want to just sound super fancy and, and Latin here, is you can say they have sola ecclesia. Mm -hmm. Is that they actually have it so that the magisterium, the teaching office of the church, can trump the Bible, right? And so when we say, you know, Mary went on and had other kids with Joseph, and it says so in Mark and a bunch of places where you can read about the brothers and sisters of the Lord, mm -hmm. and they're like, actually, those were cousins, and we've declared it so because we say Mary was perpetually right. a virgin, right. and so that overrides the Bible, Right, is that ultimately, push comes to shove, they have solum ecclesium, uh, is that it really does trump the Word and of God. And that's why they... Cannot help but have internal contradictions right. within yes, Roman yes. Catholicism. Well, and and what's really interesting, it's a very spicy time to be alive. I love uh, the Twitterverse and, and YouTube these days, is that Catholics are kind of losing their minds, mm -hmm. is that since uh, Vatican II and now with this pope, there have been so many of these contradictions exposed, mm -hmm. is that you said, you know, and we, we rightly get, you know, Trent is a, is a steaming pile of cow dung, but yet in there, they affirm some of the things that we affirm, that not mm -hmm. every part of it is heresy. And so like the death penalty is the purview of the state, the right to punish the evildoer, bear the sword. Mm -hmm. This pope has come out and said the death penalty is a sin. Mm. And you should, and so like there if if you are if uh, there there's there's no way to be a consistent catholic now. So I think we're on the close uh, of the verge of getting another, another reformation. reformation. Yeah, yeah. I, I think if you have a good faithful church out there, get ready. The Catholic refugees are coming, and, <laughs> and right. they, they will be here soon because it is it is a hot, hot mess, and mm. people are leaving all over the place. Okay, so let's wrap up this section of the Reformed Catholicity. Uh, so Reformed Catholicity is essentially... Yes. Spiritually, we are the one body of Christ. The mm -hmm. church invisible is one, and that we need to express that unity and say, to the extent that you can affirm the Nicene Creed with me, uh, we are Christians together, mm -hmm. and that that's the church universal. And some of you may have some real, real, real bad theology, but Christ can save us even if we're wrong. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Exactly. Okay, so now what is... Uh, so that's Reformed Catholicity. Yeah. What is... Covenant renewal worship. So the real best clear example we see is Joshua 24, uh, your namesake there, he's named after you, uh, is that, the, no, I'm just kidding, is that the <laughs> Moses' successor is that it was all, the, you know, first five books of the Bible, it all seems like this is the covenant that God made with Moses, mm. uh, but no, that now the Israel is going to, is supposed to, generation after generation, choose you today whom you will serve, we submit to the one covenant of God mm. uh, at uh I think Mount Gerizim, I think mm -hmm. it was, is that the, the covenant renewal service is what we are doing Sunday by Sunday. We mm -hmm. are putting ourselves again under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, having that confession of sin, the corporate confession of sin, the corporate singing and submitting to the Word of God as mm -hmm. preached by the pastor, taking that one bread, one loaf, one cup of communion together, that this is again a symbol of our unity mm -hmm. and, uh, and our submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's a great summary of covenant renewal worship. How would you say that our Reformed Catholicity and and our emphasis on covenant re renewal worship, how does that impact our community and our and our family life for the better? 
So community, I mean, if you and I have beef, if, if we're in a row, if we're in a tiff, if we have horrible things out in the world, business dealings, you rob me, I cheat you, then ultimately all of that is happening in the context of that we are part of the body. Mm-hmm. So all that, you know, Paul is, this is what the Corinthians, First Corinthians is, is probably like, are you taking each other to court? Like mm-hmm. what the bleep is wrong with you yeah. people? How could you possibly, when you are part of the one body of Christ, mm. you've got to work this out. You have got to come together and have that fellowship with one another because you are the one bride of Christ that is mm. the body that who he died for to make holy and spotless and blameless and win back to himself for all eternity. Mm. That is first and foremost, before you are white, before you are male, before you are anything else, this is who you are, identity piece number one. So this is the defining thing of our community. Mm. And then and then in your families, I mean, the family is just so under attack these days, right. is that why should I submit to my father? Why should I, you know, bear with my freaking siblings and they break my toy and just like having that, you know, how, how do I, you know, stick it out in this marriage that... I, you know, suddenly realized I shouldn't have married this person. Mm. Like, no, like how, where do you get the strength to do any of these things? How much have we been given from the Lord? Then we bend that out horizontal to each other Mm. and extend grace to the other members of the body of Christ, Mm. because we're all in this together. And we see that Sunday by Sunday, saying the creed, hearing the word, taking the bread. Mm. This, this is our proof of our unity under the Lordship of Christ mm. getting worked out, and we draw strength from that on the first day of every week to do it for six more days. So how would you say, you know, if, if I'm putting on my my Baptist hat, my, let's, let's call it evangelical, broad yeah. evangelical hat, sure. and say, well, we, we, we do that, you know, we come together and we we sing Oceans, and uh, the, you know, we get our, our Christian TED Talk. Um, no, that's me being... Yeah. spicy. No, but 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 you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're saying, well, we come together and we hear and there are some great evangelical churches that have some, you know, really good solid preaching, but they don't do uh this covenant renewal stuff that, yeah. that you're talking about. Right. Um they say, well, how is what we do not how is what you do impacting your community in a different way than what we do? Is that again, if the heart is the volunteerism, the decisionism, the personal like I chose to be here, mm. then ultimately I can choose to leave. Mm. Is that like this this comes down to to I'm at the center. Yeah. And that, you know, so much of American Christianity says, I'm going to get my life together. God is going to save me. I'm going to fix my stuff up. And then as I'm a well humming machine, I'll join a church and you know, somehow maybe, probably not, that is going to become a better and better well functioning community. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to reach out and touch the the non-Christian world and impact them. And then maybe that, you know, like material, environmental, whatever, like the, the rest of the universe, that's somewhere out there. Mm-hmm. And then and that'll just sort of maybe, I don't know how, grow into affecting everything and, and, mm-hmm. and fixing the world or something, maybe. Versus the exact opposite is the correct approach, is that God has made a good world that didn't rebel against him, and he, he's at the center, and that the material world exists. Within that, he has made his image bearers, which are human beings, and he's acting in the world to save people and bring them to himself, which we call the church primarily. Mm-hmm. It's not identical to the kingdom of God, and which your local body is a particular member mm. of, a particular instantiation of that universal church, and that you are maybe, you know, a hair coming out of the pimple on that little eruption <laughs> way, way. You're way, 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 way out on the periphery. God loves you. Mm. I'm not trying to say yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. nothing. It's not worm theology, but like you're not the center. Yeah. And without that dethroning of the self from the center, mm. how are you going to get the strength to persevere in your bad marriage? How are you going mm. to get the strength to stick with your tough job, support uh, your family, make the right decisions, love these awkward, stupid, weird, funky, singing out of tune people, you know, like that screw tape letter of like, <laughs> yeah, like that's right. oh, this is the church? What? Is that like, no, this is God mm. acting and that you are called to be a part of this great big super mega story that is going on that is his story mm. and which you get invited in mm. as opposed to your story that God is helping perpetuate. That That is wonderful um, <laughs> because it's something that I've been thinking of a lot really over the last three or four years. What book was it that I read? Um, it was called Divine Sex, I think. How provocative. Yeah, it was it was about it was about uh 
um, sexuality, biblical mm. sexuality. Um, but one of the points they made uh, within that book, I can't remember, was that Eugene Peterson? I can't remember. Um, but one of the points that he made was talking about uh, how consumeristic the church has become yeah. uh, and how it has become all about me. Mm. And this it doesn't, this was a peripheral, a peripheral topic that he was touching on in the book, but it, it made me think of uh, when I first started reading that, the real problem we have with consumerism in the church, how it becomes, like you're saying, all about me, yeah. I'm the consumer, and what's going on at church is I am picking, when I'm trying to select a church, I'm trying to select which church makes me feel good, which one has the teaching that I like, which one right. has the music that I like. Yep. It becomes all about me, 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 yeah. um, and and everything about kind of the modern evangelical church experience feeds into that, yeah. right? Even even the structure of our mega churches right. look like choice, shopping choice malls. of serv- oh, and just choice of services. Do you want contemporary, traditional, yep. blended? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, and everything about it, and including up up until like we've got a band up there that's putting on a concert. Yeah. Basically, it becomes here are our Christian professionals delivering our spiritual goods yeah. and services to the people, which is medieval Catholicism yeah, that, all over again. That's right. Oh, yeah. ah. And so, and so, the question then becomes when I discovered this and I started realizing that this is a huge problem because it's feeding into like kind of our, our modern ethos which is we are consumers at almost we're raised to be consumers yes um and uh and so how do we fight against that and I, and I remember whenever I was discovering the problem I could not figure out the solution because I I knew that okay I, I was starting to see yeah we've got this band playing on Sundays and that's good you know mm. I can get a nice worship session out yeah, of that the vibe, but, yeah. but but everything about the way we've structured everything feeds into it and, right and you know we hop around from church to church till we find that perfect one and getting back around to the question of covenant renewal worship and and co- the idea of covenant um the way that we do church at our church yeah at Pilgrim Hill Reform Fellowship come check us out Goodlettsville Tennessee we have lots of fun it's wonderful it's great great church um the way that we do church in the covenant renewal fashion uh, in our hi- high liturgy, not the highest, no, but you yeah, know, yeah, higher liturgy, yeah, um, is is the answer to how we fight against consumerism. Because instead of church being a thing that I go consume the music, I go consume the teaching, I go consume the experience, and yes. if I really like it, then I stick around. Instead, it becomes um, all centered around covenant, God's covenant with us, and our covenant with God and His people, embodied, embodied, right? And instead of Going con- and consuming a worship service, well, the, the the whole the word liturgy even means the work of the people. The work of the we people. We are coming to the Lord's service on the Lord's day. Yeah. To do the work of worship together. Yeah. And you know the, we do music. We do just a piano. And I'm not saying there's no way to have a band. It's uh, possible. There. It, it could it could be, but only when the worship instruments are serving. To bolster the true instrument, yes, which is the voice of the saints, right, right, and so uh, in, in that way, it's not a thing we're going to consume; it's a thing we go do together, right. We worship the Lord together, yes. um, and, and and COVID was such a good clarifying knife just through all of this. It's mm-hmm. like to the extent that your church can be consumed on YouTube. It's not a church. Mm. Is that if you're not doing any work, if you're not eating the bread, singing the song, kneeling down, mm. standing up, raising your hand, uh, loving your neighbor, greeting you know your fellow brother and sister in Christ with a holy kiss, like right. Zach does to me every week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zach, that, that I love it. I it, love it. It's it's got to be embodied. Mm. And so this has just been a great test these days to be like. You think church is something that like you can do with your camera off mm-hmm. uh, from like what what do mm. you even think we're doing here? What is this? And you you wonder why it's not helping you. Mm. That's good. Yeah. Okay, that does it for our question from Jack. Let's move on to ooh, a real good one from Jacob, which uh Jacob on Twitter has been dude, he's a firebrand. I don't know if oh, you yeah? follow him. Yeah. You should follow Jacob I on need Twitter. To hit follow there, yes. Um so if you don't follow Jacob, uh, you should follow him on Twitter. His Twitter handle is JT Dixon, and he is always coming out with the best tweets, and he's really funny. Okay. Yeah, okay. you and him would be some good meme lords together. Excellent, excellent, for the kingdom. Um, and that goes actually for all our all my Twitter... Our, our, that, that goes for all my Patreon supporters. We have fun on Discord, but we also have lots of fun on Twitter, so... 
Uh, I might, you know what? I'm all the guys that I ask questions for. I'm going to link their twitters in the bio of this excellent of this episode. Wonderful. So go give them a follow, guys. Yeah. So next up, we're going to tackle Jacob's question: What are the differences between Reformed Baptist and Reformed Presbyterian theology? So I think there, there's two main things going on there, and a lot of times people don't parse this out. So the big, big categories are that Reformed Baptists have a different polity, which is a fancy word for saying church government structure. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's shorter. And they also have a different view of children, obviously, mm. which we already have kind of touched on here. So I think I'll go in reverse order here. The children is probably the main one that people think of. Right. We uh, presbies. Yes. Presbos. Yes. We baptize our babies. Yes. And uh, our Reformed Baptist brethren. Yes. Do not. So the the key difference there is to say that for us, you know, I, I can't speak for them because I don't feel like they answer my objections super duper well, so I'm just <laughs> going to raise them. Uh, and you can feel free to trash me in the comments. I want to hear. I'd love to hear if somebody has a good refute of this. Because most of our viewers are uh, Baptists who are reforming. Yes. And so a lot of them are Reformed Baptists. So right. answer Robert's question Come if at you me. may. Yeah, please. I, I love a good uh, uh, interaction. So the idea is that throughout the Old Testament, um, the covenant, so we've already talked about the unity of the covenants, and Reformed Baptists are with mm-hmm. us on that, is that what happened with Abraham? Abraham was, you know, by faith, came into the relationship with God where he had not had one, and the sign of the covenant, Genesis 17, uh, 15, was uh, circumcision, was mm-hmm. applied to him. And then it says, all of your descendants on the eighth day circumcise them as members coming into uh, the covenant. This children being part of the relationship continues with the law, mm. is that Passover, you're sitting around like, hey, what are we doing? Why is, what's Passover, mom and dad? Well, funny you should ask, son. God told me to be ready with these questions that you were going to have and to tell you why we eat this unleavened uh, bread and these bitter herbs to rem- and sit in brown and booths mm. and remember the wilderness wandering. You know, mm. all of these things that there's just over and over again the expectation that the children are with you. At the temple sacrifices, you're bringing your shalom offering, you get the free, you know, they're not free, you cost a bunch of money, but you bring your barbecue meat and you sit down and it doesn't get burnt up. The priest comes and you, your family, your children mm. and you have a barbecue meal with the priest uh, outside the tabernacle or the temple. So all throughout the Old Testament, we have the covenant being including the children. Mm. And it just seems insane that there would be this massive monster change and the onus is on the Reformed Baptists to say when this started, and find me the text, to say that now the children are excluded Mm -hmm. until they pass some kind of intellectual, emotional hurdle Mm. that they can articulate their faith to then be able to join the community. Mm -hmm. This just does not make any kind of sense, because ultimately there are two kinds of people, Mm. the saved and the unsaved. Mm -hmm. And and so God has said, if there's just... legion of verses, I will be a God to you and to your children after you, is said so many times throughout the Psalms, the prophets, the law, it's just everywhere in the Old Testament, and Acts chapter 2, I think is it 25, where is the the idea that your children are included in this covenant, Mm -hmm. that the, the, the root, we've talked about this many times today, is that the root of where this Baptistic view comes from is to say decisionism. Mm-hmm. I make the choice, I follow God, that's really the heart about where uh, you come into being a believer or not, mm-hmm. as opposed to, is it possible, to when you, and when you look at the whole corpus of biblical data, that there are the majority of people in heaven are going to be ones who never had a day when they didn't know the Lord, mm. is that God is not require you to have a conversion experience. Mm. That in a time when you're, like today, I mean, you know, honestly, we live in a time when a lot of people need a conversion experience. Sure. I'm not hating on that. I had one. Mm-hmm. I have Same. February 1995, I am unsaved. April 1995, I am mm. saved. Mm. Like, it is nearly a 180. I say I did 179 degree turn in my life. It really was a monster mega change. Mm. And, and so, yeah, I'm all, but my children did not grow up, you know, and then have some little time when they went out and pimped prostitutes and sold drugs, <laughs> and yeah. then they came back, and then they could be saved right. after they had some stuff like that. Mm. So, like, so many people have falling away time. They get more mature as they get older. Please, please get more mature as you get older. Yeah. If you're not doing that, you're, yeah. you're falling behind. But that 
that does not mean that everyone needs to have this conversion experience, this decisionistic moment. Mm. And so the, the whole biblical data taken as from, from start to finish, I will be a God to you and to your children mm. after you, would have us say that just like God calls people out of the world, he then takes their whole family and, you know, raise your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and they will not depart from it when they are old. So I, I hear my... I'll put on my Baptist please. hat. Please, yeah, please. Um, and say, okay, what about John 3? Um, everyone, if you are to enter the kingdom of heaven, everyone must be born again. So yeah. are you saying that uh, you're saying that they don't need this uh, conversion experience? Well, are you saying that um, they don't need to be born again? What are you saying? If, if only we had an example that we read every Christmas of somebody who was saved in the womb. Oh, yeah, Jesus' cousin, John, <laughs> kicked and rejoiced to see his Lord over mm. there. That, like, you know, from my mother's breast, you have, you know, I have known the ways of the Lord, mm. David says in the Psalms, is that it is entirely possible to be born again mm. without having to be able to articulate PhD level theology to mm. the people around you that trust in the Lord, faith, following, dependence, I need you, Jesus, I cannot save myself, mm. is something that God can work in anyone. So you're saying that uh, it's a rather normative uh, approach to salvation. God's One of God's more normative approaches to salvation would be to regenerate infants, would you say that? The children of believers mm. is that we should expect, until proven otherwise, mm -hmm. that God is not letting us populate hell, mm -hmm. that we do not come, you know, and, and we are all children of Adam. Yeah. By nature, we are hell-bound. That mm. is who we are. Right. We are systemically depraved because we are in Adam by birth. Right. And yet, God has said, your children... I, you and your whole household will be saved, is that if you are raising your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, they do not need to have a sinner's prayer card with a date on it mm -hmm. about when they ha went from unsaved to saved. Right. That's not a necessary component that we find on any page of the Bible. This was a huge paradigm shift for me. It really is. Because, uh, so what you're saying is, is that yes, you believe and affirm with John chapter 3 that every single person who must is be born again must be be yeah. born again. Stop being a son of Adam and be a son of Jesus Christ. Exactly. But what I found uh, to be the one of the biggest paradigm shifts within the Presbyterian world is to say, we're not supposing that we have the knowledge and understanding, and we're not trying to pin down that moment of regeneration. Right. Even in John yes. 3, it says that it's a Despite mystery. Despite the fact that for many, many people... This, this person, you can, I, I have a date. Yeah. April 28th, 1995, sure. I went from, you know, I said, I want Jesus Christ to be my personal Lord and Savior. Right, right. 6 p.m. ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. Like, that was how clear it is for me. Mm. Does that have to be the case for everyone? And, and so, yeah, so the paradigm shift then is to say, well, it's great when it's clear. Right. So it, there are... Well, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I might even push back there, is okay. that like, I have 16 years of being a rank, rank pagan. Oh, and I see. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and like, right, like right. It's, it's, it's convenient to yeah. have a date when I went from non-Christian to Christian, but that means that my old man, when I talk about the, the, the non-Christian, you know, the Adam side of me, he's right at my heels. Mm. He's super duper close. Yeah. I watch one cuss-soaked movie and I'm back to being a foul-mouthed sailor <laughs> of just letting slip four-letter words. It's like, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's so close because I had mm. so many formative years being on Team Satan, right. is that it is so much better. Yes. Why would you wish that everybody would have this conversion experience mm. when it means that you were in the grip and, and power of Satan for all those years of your life good. until that moment? Everybody who's there, who's on Team Satan now, I want them to have a conversion yes. experience. Amen. Yeah. But the children of belief, why would you foist that upon people growing up in the church, mm. never, never having a day when they don't know the Lord? Mm. I don't wish that for them. Mm. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to have some big falling away so they can have some clear conversion experience. Well, even to be fair to our Baptist brethren, a lot of them, uh, and <laughs> this speaks to why we have so many rededications. Yes. Uh, not re yeah, rededicating yeah. your life, rebaptism. Rebaptism. Uh, is because, um, because they too don't want their children to ever have a day that they don't know the love of the Lord, uh, the love of Christ. And so they, you know, at seven years old, it's like, you believe in God, right? 
Yes. Yeah. 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 And you believe that Jesus is your Savior, right? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, well, let's pr- let's pray together. Let's pray. Great. Yes. We can baptize him. He's in. Yeah. But then, because of the focus on, uh, basically, the focus is your Christ. When you become a Christian, they say basically uh, baptism is your coming out as a Christian celebration. Yes. Right. It's to say we're going to baptize you because you've sh- you've shown that you are a Christian. Right. Right. Instead of baptize, instead of what we would say as the pre- on the Presbyterian side of things is that baptism isn't a coming out party isn't you claiming Christ right baptism is Christ claiming you amen exactly Bam. It's the ob- objectivity of the covenant promises to yes. your children right it has nothing to do with how you feel what you think right um and so that's 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 a really big paradigm shift because we think that okay we don't want to give uh the covenant sign to someone who's not regenerate right well within the Presbyterian world we say it's not our business to know who's regenerate and who's not regenerate what we have are the promises of God, which include our children. And, you know, but again, it's, it's funny you, you put it that way, because there are plenty of people in our day and age who we do say, like, you are not a Christian, and now you come wanting this. Why should I baptize you? Mm. We should exercise the keys of the kingdom there and say, you were clearly a pagan. What has changed? And mm. we want to hear them confess Jesus yes. is Lord. Yes. So, so again, the, the, the downplaying of sacraments in the American church has had profound consequences mm. for a lack of understanding about what is baptism, right. everything you're just saying. And then that same idea about like uh, sacraments marking people out, the Lord's Supper, do not, t- if you're living in sin, if you've walked, we're, the main way of exercising church discipline is to say, you are excommunicated, this is the, mm. the biggest gun, is w- you are excommunicated, you don't get to have Jesus' body and blood, the life of the person, mm. is you are cut off from, because now you're not living like a Christian. Right. And so those, those views about like, this is the line where God claims you, that's mm-hmm. baptism, and then this is the upkeep of the food of life to live for forever. Right. Whoever does not eat my flesh and drink my blood has no part in me, the, the, the eternal life, John 6. Like, that view of the sacraments is almost the exact opposite mm. of what you've got going on in American Christianity. I decide that's baptism, which is why it can happen six, seven, eight times in a life, and that communion is some obscure ritual with no meaning whatsoever, but then I rededicate my life at the altar call. Mm. Like, just this... How important and central are the sacraments that God gives us mm. for understanding the Christian life and who's in and what does it mean and, and those boundaries and those markers? One hundred percent. And I think that the one of the things, one of the pieces to that puzzle that really took me a while to really grasp onto and take hold of myself was was the idea that there can be a Christian who is unregenerate. Mm. Uh, that's a that's a big category. Um, paradigm shift that yes. I, I didn't I didn't have a category for that right someone who's a this is a baptized Christian but their life demonstrates that they are not regenerate and so we don't say you're not regenerate we say your life is demonstrating that you, that you do not love the Lord Jesus your you are in rebellion sucks. your yeah. fruit stinks <laughs> yes right yep and so now we are exercising church discipline church discipline the keys of the kingdom that God has given to the elders uh, of a church and now we are putting you outside the outside of the covenant Right. Um, so you you are a baptized Christian who is now apostate, and so at that point you should not have assurance that you are regenerate. Right. That's that's the point in which you need to that's you do the soul searching. Say I've been excommunicated. There's no reason to believe that I'm regenerate until such time as I repent and come back. Um, come back to the covenant. Right. You know, right. So so in, in my family uh, devotion, we've been going through the book of Matthew, mm. and Matthew 13 was such a great moment here because my daughters have lots of Baptist friends. Mm. And and so this, uh, if you're familiar with the parable of the wheat and the tares, mm-hmm. I'm, I've started out on King James when I got saved, so I, I, don't, I don't know what it's called in ESV, <laughs> but that there's these things, there's this wheat and there's this wheat looking stuff. And that if you get overzealous and are like, there's weeds, let's just rip it all up now. Mm. Uh, Jesus says, particularly in this parable, like, no, once it's clear, when they come up and you can totally discern and it's obvious this is wheat and this is junk, then you can start harvesting uh, up these things here. But that if you are just like overzealous of saying like this, you know, and the, 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 the application is to uh, talking to children growing up in the faith here is that like this six-year-old is not articulating a clear doctrine 
of you know justification by faith alone. Mm. And so let's you know we're not counting them as Christian now. Is that there are age appropriate ways that this goes, and that it makes parenting more difficult. I totally agree. But that this is what God is calling us to: is to don't be some over eager person who's like we can ultra mega fine re- redefine you know finely define who is saved and who is not in the church now ultimately like we were the holy spirit mm. we're going to be able to discern the wheat from the tares perfectly right. that's the holy spirit's job mm. when it's obvious it's obvious go for it do it judge by the fruit yes but that doesn't mean that you're trying to peer into the heart and say don't baptize that baby mm-hmm. they haven't shown uh that they you know are uh, confessing Christ alone in faith, you know, alone, you know, solo Deo Gloria, like that. This is this is this is too much, too soon. Mm-hmm. Matthew thirteen, parable of the wheat and tares, is that that the judgment is not ultimately ours, except when it's obvious. Mm. Um, is that this is the Holy Spirit, the, the angels, the reapers at the end of the age. Mm. So that is the primary difference yeah. between yes. uh, Reformed Baptists and Reformed uh, Presbyterians. Yes. Uh, d- do you know of any distinctions? Uh, I'm sure there are some, but in their in their versions of covenant theology, I mean, they they have to in order to be able to do what we just said for that not to be an automatic consequence. There right. is that. Um, so people talk about continuity versus discontinuity right. between the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and the after Jesus New Testament Greek Scriptures. Yeah, and so they would lean much more on the radical discontinuity. Uh, between that versus we would say God has given us all 66 books, and yes, it's interpretive work to figure out what to get out of Genesis is, is hard mm-hmm. at times, but that all of it is, th- th- we would emphasize the continuity yeah. a lot more than Particularly in the realm of the, se- of the, se- the, the signs of the covenant. Right, right. exactly. Right. Yeah. So okay. That's a primary thing. Excellent. Now let's move on to polity. What is, first of all, what is polity? Yeah. And what are the distinctions, the differences between Reformed Baptist polity and Reformed Presbyterian polity. So I have to mention one more, because okay. there are three... So polity is church government. How is the church governed? What is the, the hierarchy? How are, how are things laid out? Where's the authority? Mm-hmm. What's the structure? Who makes it? the decision? Who makes the decision? Who ultimately can do this? We were just mm-hmm. talking about the keys. Who's got the keys? And so really, you have three choices. Either you've got many layers, two layers, or one layer. So that that's the that's the you, know, you got the wedding cake you got the the birthday cake and you got a pancake so okay. the, these these, <laughs> yeah, these are these like are the choices that. okay and so the real words so those are my cute words the real words are Episcopalian mm-hmm. which means you have a hierarchy of hierarchies so there's your priest mm. who is under a bishop who is under an archbishop who is under a cardinal who is under there's what's the fun word primate mm. not a monkey uh, but they have all these and the, uh, there's there's all these different and the, and then the pope or the mm-hmm. uh, archbishop of Canterbury um, is that there's this hierarchy of yeah. just up, 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 versus that's Episcopalian. And so Catholics have that, uh, Anglicans have that. That's uh, many, many layers. Mm. Two layers is what we would say we find in Timothy and Titus, where Paul is laying out church government, mm-hmm. is that there are, uh, there, are, there are people who are elders, and they come in two kinds, ruling elders and uh, pastors or teaching elders. That's showing our cards a little bit, uh, yeah. even on an in-house debate. Right, um, right, yeah. So, offices. okay, so yeah, so that, that was a little over. So there are elders and there are non-elders mm-hmm. here, and that the elders make the decisions uh, for uh, excommunication, uh, church membership, mm-hmm. a discipline, all these, who's got the keys? Yep. And that that seems, to, and so the even the Anglicans agree that, uh, I think, is it Lightfoot is the great scholar who says, like, yeah, that's what's in the New Testament, but then for expediency's sake, because the church got so big, it was good to add bishops and these mm. other layers. And so that's a, that's a whole other debate there, but that most of them do say, what does the Bible say is the two-layer cake. Mm-hmm. Um, but then um, when you get down to um, Congregationalists and Baptists, they say each and every church is its own entirely separate organization, and that if they voluntarily want to be part of the... Southern Baptist Convention. Southern Baptist Convention, American Baptist Convention, whatever part they want to do, then they can do that, but they don't have any binding authority over us. There aren't some group up there. There's not a presbytery, which is just a collection of presbyters, Mm -hmm. a group of elders that can then speak into and say, your church went off the rails, you've become a heretic, or or whatever. Mm -hmm. They don't have that. Every church is independent and on its own. And so we would point to the passages where Paul talks about church government and say, 
no, actually there are people that God is calling to have this authority. Mm -hmm. We are all priests. We don't want to get into using that. You know, this is the universal priesthood of all believers, Mm. great doctrine of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not like there's priests and non-priests, which, you know, Catholics say, but that we, we, we want to say there are people who are called to this office by God uh, with authority mm-hmm. given by God, like all authority is, and we get that from the Word of God itself. Mm. So where do congregationalists get their biblical support? So uh, we're, let's just write off at the at the outset the Episcopalian model. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, no. Because even from the description oh, what if you, you gave, like hats? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, uh, because even as you said, uh, it's it's it was more of an, an, an out of necessity or expediency as as the church grew, that you know we just needed to add these layers of hierarchy. Um, let's just write that off as uh, as fun factoid and focus in on the differences between the Presbyterian model and the Congregational model. Where where do the Congregationalists get their support for this version of church polity? I think I mean if at least again this would be a great spot here if you know more about this than I do to chime in in the in the comment section. I'd love to hear. If anybody has something to say, more, more they know more about this than I do. This isn't my flavor of Christianity, so yeah. I'm not I'm not an expert. Um, but the idea that Paul, you know, the New Testament, what are all the books of the New Testament after apart from the Gospels, is letters to individual churches, mm-hmm. and so that the office of apostle is speaking can speak across churches, but there is no other. Uh, office that can do that. And since we don't have apostles, mm. then nobody can speak across authoritatively authoritatively across churches. So okay. at least and and again, the episcopal model was the one from let's say 250 to uh 1500. Mm. Like this was the only model that was going um in in the church there. So it's That's it's it's that they, they they don't primarily I don't think Congregationalists primarily say we're not Presbyterian. Mm. They say we're not Episcopalian. We're not right. hierarchical in that way. I see. I see. Yeah, because um, whenever I read the New Testament, this was actually one of the really one of the big pushing factors. One of the factors that really pushed me into the Presbyterian model. Yeah, was because. Uh, whenever I read the New Testament, I see these examples of church councils, and I see Paul writing to the church at Corinth. There, I don't believe there was a mega church right, at yeah, Corinth. Yeah, he's talking to collectively yeah. the church right. at Corinth, right? Um, and expecting maybe twenty-five, thirty, fifty homes that they knows? met in. Who knows? It, 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 definitely a plurality right. of people that met in all these different places, each of which had elders, right. and yet he calls it the church in Corinth. Right, and we're seeing councils deciding to send uh, apostles and, and different things like that to different areas. Yeah, Acts 15. Yeah, exactly. And so I remember thinking to myself, as a non-denominational kind of evangelical, uh, when we were planting our church in Los Angeles, I was like, realizing that we don't have any accountability. Right. We have another church that kind of helps resource us, a sister church, Yeah, but they're not really over us. They don't really have any authority real authority over yeah. our church. And I remember watching... Uh, have you heard of... You know who Matthew Everhart is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's great on YouTube. He's yeah. a PCA guy, I think. Yes. Um, Very soft-spoken. Yeah, 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 yeah. he is. Um, he's a, he, He's got some really good stuff. I remember he did a video when I was first getting Reformation red-pilled. Uh, he did a video called What If Mark Driscoll Had Been Presbyterian? Mm. Because uh, it was whenever that great whole... title. Yeah, yeah. It was when that uh, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill yeah. podcast came out. Yeah. And... Rise and Fall of Mark Driscoll by Mars Hill. No, no, it was called The Rise and Fall of Mars oh, Hill. I think the par- podcast yeah, it was okay. about Mark Driscoll. It was about Mark Driscoll. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, by Christianity Today. So it had yes, a, it had right, a, right. a um, little soft, squishy, more liberal take. Yes. But, uh, but anyway, he, he did a response to that. What if Mark Driscoll had been Presbyterian? And man, did it convict me. Because basically he says, okay, what happened? There was a lot of issues that went on with Mars Hill. But if uh, if Mark Driscoll had been Presbyterian, one, he couldn't have taken the church every which way he wanted to, based on his own doctrinal new rediscovery or discovery of you know this new theological point that he wanted to uh, incorporate into the into his church model. And so you know we're reformed, oh, but we're charismatic, oh, but we're you know kind of back and forth, blown to and fro. He wouldn't have been able to do that because right. he would have been confined to the, the standards, right. whether Westminster or whatever it was. Yes. Um, 
And so having that, that anchor. Yeah. There was, so that would have been one thing that would have stopped. Another thing, he would have had to complete seminary. Yeah. He would have had to, uh, well, there was a, another big one was he wouldn't have been the sharpest guy in the room. Right. Um, when he's accountable to other, uh, yeah. other members of a presbytery, because at a presbytery meeting, you are, you're in the room with a bunch of incredibly intelligent, sharp mm, yeah. pastors right. who have proven their merit yes. over years and years of ministry. Right. But whenever you're this bulwark of a guy, this lead guy who's very intelligent, yes. you can just bulldoze people. Right. Right. Yeah. But you wouldn't have, he wouldn't have been able to do that in right. the context of a of a presbytery that had with other elders who had authority over him. Right. Um together, collectively, not right. one, right? right? Not the hierarchy. Yeah. But he's accountable to these other ones. Um and uh and basically, he demonstrated that uh, the the disaster that happened at Mars Hill would have happened yeah. if he had been. And it happened in St. Louis, where I lived with uh, Darren Patrick. Mm, yeah, same yeah. thing. Yep. And so, uh, yeah. And so, I remember when I listened to that, and I was like, "Oh, that is true." And we are just this kind of free floating, atomistic, individualistic congregation with no individualistic. There exactly. it is again. There exactly. It is again. Yeah. Um, accountable to no one. And we began to crave that accountability, and that's what that's one of the main things that started us on our journey towards the CREC. We reached out to the CREC um, on the West Coast and was like, hey, can we just come check you guys out? Uh, yeah. We're looking for that kind of oversight and accountability that comes with being a part of a denomination. And they invited Authority us Authority is real. Yes. It actually is a God-ordained part mm. of the universe, and if you don't have it in there, then you are going to spiral out of control and, like— Checks and balances. All these people, yeah. you know, many of them Driscoll type people are super conservative and would say like, "I don't want Obama as king" or you know, whatever, like crazy, you know, that was in those days. And 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 yet here we are of like this pastor is king. Mm. He's got no accountability. That's There's right. no one above him. And whoever is the highest, and you can't question, that's God. That's right. And Woo! you don't want any man to be God. No, we make crummy gods. We it turns make out. crummy gods. Amen to that. So that's a that's a pretty good summary of the differences between yeah the um, biggest two right there yeah. yeah so I guess we were kind of comparing more of the evangelical congregational are you familiar with kind of that do the Reformed Baptist what are some other distinctions and the specifically the Reformed Baptist polity because one of the things that uh, that struck me when I was first getting into this was uh, in the Reformed Baptist world. There is a seems to be a greater emphasis on the priesthood of all believers. Yeah. Over against in the Presbyterian world, not that there's no emphasis in the Presbyterian world because we believe that obviously, mm -hmm. but um, we, uh, for example, as a Baptist, even in the Reformed Baptist world, um, really anyone can baptize. Right? Yeah. So anyone, you, you're the one who led them to Christ. Right. Why don't you baptize them? And that was appealing to me because you know I. I, I I imagined Jesus giving the Great Commission to all Christians. Yeah. And that's true in a sense. It is. But he was also giving the Great Commission to the apostles. Right. So was he giving it to the church as a whole? Yes, but was but was he giving that the the call to go make disciples and baptize? Was he giving that to every individual Christian or was he giving that to the church collective led by elders? Right. What would you say to that? I mean, I think one thing that you have to always recognize is when you're reading the Bible is where are we in redemptive history? Mm -hmm. So when you said about baptism, I thought about how Philip uh, baptized the Ethiopian eunuch mm -hmm. in Acts chapter 8, and he's just a deacon. Mm. And and yet, I mean, you know, the next, the previous chapter, the, the Stephen is a deacon, and he gives one of the longest sermons in the New Testament. Mm. And so, like, these are these are super deacons. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's the, right. But the, the, the idea that... We live in an age where authority, like we just were just saying here, is that this is like either we just forget that it even exists or we are allergic mm. to it and that I don't want to be under anybody is me and my Bible and Jesus mm. is is just the is there shouldn't be nothing higher. I don't mm. submit to anybody. I don't believe in in authority. And and that really just is, you know, don't trust anybody over 30 hippie moron kind of thinking. That's not biblical mm. in any way. All authority has been given to me, says right. Jesus, and we submit to him, and he has instituted authorities among men. Mm. We get People get so confused about Romans 13, because yep. they don't think about, God, these are God-given authorities, and we submit to them mm. insofar as they are following what God right. says for the authority to do. So I think... There is a certain extent to which, yeah, you're in a POW camp and it's just you and the unordained, you know, Eric Little is, you know, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you can take a funky sacrament of uh, rice and water instead of bread and wine because that's what you have because there are, you know, 
Japanese uh, prison guards with guns to your heads. Like, like there are extreme circumstance versions of mm -hmm. things. I don't want to discount, That's you good. know, bind somebody's conscience in that way. But what does it mean to be fitting and orderly, to be doing things decently and to, and to actually be submitting to the authority of Christ and the authorities that he has put in your life? Mm. Your parents, your pastor, the magistrate, you know, like these, these kinds of authorities, we need to be the most clear proponents of order in our day. Mm. And I think that the administration of sacraments uh, in, a, in an age where there aren't apostles and we do have the word of God, and we're not just like freewheeling chaos. Mm. I mean, yeah, you're 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 somebody who converts in Saudi Arabia, and you know, telling people about it is going to get your head cut off. Yeah, I think you can disobey the like tell it like be judicious, be wise as serpents, mm. and tell the right people about Christ and obey the the great commission in a careful, careful way. Mm. Like that, there. But that in over here in America. If you're out there just baptizing people yourself in your little kitty wading pool in your backyard or, 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 you know, waiting, the real one that I hear about all the time is people like, oh, I put off baptism until I had my trip to Israel and could go in the Jordan River right. and I get the real <laughs> baptism there. It's like that, that kind of malarkey is not obedience to Christ mm. and the order that he has made. Mm. And so, yeah, respect your pastor, respect your family, respect the authorities that God has put into your life. Mm. And, and, and... In a normal situation, it is the the pastor of a church in a, on a Sunday morning doing these these sacraments, mm. and you better have a real good excuse to Jesus. You know, the the thief on the cross who didn't submit to baptism, he was a little busy dying, <laughs> yeah. and, and like he's excused for not having obeyed. Mm. You know, to get baptized as soon as you believe. Yeah, is is your excuse that good? Mm. Mm. That's good. <laughs> yes. that's very good. That's very good. Um, well, that's that's helpful. I think that was a good way to wrap up our, our discussion on the differences between uh, Presbyterian and Reformed Baptist polity. And I think we're going to wrap up the discussion there. We're going to do one extra question specifically for our Patreon supporters. So if you want that one, you're going to have to just join the Patreon. Please. Come on. Come on in. Come on Water's in. Water's fine. We have, it's, it's nice and warm. Mm -hmm. It's cozy. Yes. Yeah. We're not really in, in, in a jacuzzi or anything. No, so. no, no. But I'm not opposed. Maybe we should have a we should have a, a little uh, little jacuzzi trip. Cigar and jacuzzis. Oh, that sounds good. Mm, Reformation yes. red pills, cigar and jacuzzi trip. Come Excellent. on now. Yes, let's All go. Right. Yes. All right. Nice. That escalated quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's... Uh, <laughs> all right, so that does it for our episode. If you want to hear this last question, which the question is, I'll give you a little teaser, is, is it unbiblical to have women deacons? Mm. So that is our question. If you want to hear Robert's answer to that, because Robert knows. My reformed rant. <clears throat> the, Re the Reformation rants with Robert Murphy. If you want to hear that, you're going to have to join our Patreon. And with that, I will leave you guys with our normal every week charge. May you, dear viewer... Go and build, defend, and expand the kingdom of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.